Take your Bibles and join me tonight in turning to Jeremiah chapter number two. Jeremiah chapter number two tonight. I trust all of you had a good afternoon. Uh, for those of you that take the traditional nap, I hope you got one of those in. If not, pretend like it, all right? And uh, I remember years ago, of course, it's around Valentine's uh, <clears throat> Day, and my wife and I at our church were members at Maranatha Baptist in Shelby, and they were doing the honey, or the, it was sort of like a spinoff of the old dating game uh, where they would have your wife in there and they would ask her questions about you while you're out and they call you in and then you see if her answers were good. I hate those kind of games, not because uh, my wife and I are on different pages. I, just, I would just soon watch somebody else go through that embarrassment than us. <clears throat> and I remember my wife and I were, uh, and then we'd probably been married, I'd say, oh, I don't know, 12, 13 years at the time. We've been married 23 years now. And uh, one of the questions, I, I, they had asked her all these questions while I was gone. They brought me back in the room. And uh, they asked my wife the question. They said, what does your husband do on Sunday afternoons? And uh, that was really a tricky question. I didn't know how to answer it. And sure enough, my wife answered it to a T. And I just answered it the same way. Because usually if I'm not at home, uh, I'll take a nap on Sunday afternoons. But if I am at home, I just read and study. And so when they asked me that question, pulled me downstairs and I'm in the room and they, I'm like, there's no telling what she said. And I gave that exact answer. And when they did, my wife flipped that card and that's exactly what it said. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, that's great. And uh, we won a gift card in that game. So that was a profitable uh, experience. But that was on Valentine's Day. But I hope you got a nap in or if you didn't and you studied or I don't know what your Sunday afternoon routine is, but... Uh, Sundays do, they should hold a special place in your heart and uh, hold a priority there. Well, Jeremiah chapter number two is where we'll be this evening. I've thought a little bit in recent days about the prophets. Uh, I'm afraid the prophets would not be well accepted by a lot of Christianity today. Uh, they were sometimes very bold in what they had to say. Many times very bold in what they had to say, and they delivered strong messages. And I think the message of the prophets would have very well been misunderstood by a lot of Christians today. They would have said that they were harsh, uh, unloving, unaccommodating, but they were raised up for such a time. There was hardness in the hearts of the nation of Israel. And so tonight I want us to take a look at a certain episode in the life of Israel where their hearts were at. And ask ourselves the question, are we willing to learn from Israel tonight? I hope we are. Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, and the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase, and all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and have become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt and led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priests said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. And after that long indictment, notice verse number 9. God says, Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord. 
and with your children's children will I plead. And for the next few moments tonight, I want to talk about the good old days in Israel. You know, the older I'm getting, the more nostalgic I'm becoming. I'm 44 years old and I talk sometimes like I'm 90. <clears throat> Don't you remember back in the good old days? And depending on your age tonight, the good old days is really a comparative and subjective term, depending on when your good old days were. For me, the good old days were when you still had antennas affixed on top of your television with tinfoil on the ends to make sure younger people tonight are looking at me like I have no clue what you are talking about. I still remember going to my mamaw's house and uh, she was a fan, believe it or not, of wrestling. She used to love to watch it on Saturday nights. And I would go to my mamaw's house and she would have me stand with my hand on the tin foil of the television antenna so that she could watch the uh, wrestling show. Uh, for the good old days, for me, I can remember I was raised in a community called Four Corners. It was just behind our place. And it had a small convenience store. The proprietor there, her name was John C. Shelton. And uh, Miss Shelton, she ran that store even after her husband passed. And I can still remember going in with my dad. And my dad would pick me up and he would set me on top of the stainless steel drink coolers. We didn't have uh, in those days... At in our area, we weren't upscale yet. We didn't have the glass sliding doors. It was a stainless steel box with sliding uh, doors. And when you reached in, you didn't mainly grab aluminum, you grabbed glass. My dad would buy me a small Coke about yay high and he would pop the lid off, set me on top of that stainless steel cooler with a bag of peanuts in one hand and a Coke in another. And I would simply do what everybody else did, and that's they dump their peanuts into the Coke. You say, I've never heard of that. Well, you've never lived until you've done it. Amen. You say, what did it taste like? It tasted awful, but everybody else did it, and I was going to as well. But you know, life was a lot different then. It was a lot more carefree. Uh, dirt clods didn't cost a thing to throw. Uh, sometimes the days would seem so long that I would wish them away. I would never do that anymore. But those were for me, those were the good old days. And all of you tonight, you should be able to look back in the past. And for some of you, it's like, yes, I remember when I was a kid and there was just iPhone 4S's. You know, your, your perspective is going to be a lot different than mine. But no matter where you fit in the scheme of things, all of us tonight, even the young ones, can at least reminisce a little bit and talk about the good old days. But I want to tell you something that's really heartbreaking is when you listen to somebody talk about their lives and you soon realize that the best days of their lives spiritually are in the past. That's a very sad place to be. And do you know, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, that's not a place where God intends for any child of God to be. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about God's will. It's Valentine's uh, time at the college. Maybe a young man comes to a young lady and says, you're God's will for my life. And she says, well, the Lord's not told me, so just get away from me. Have you ever had it where people would tell you God's will? I mean, they would just corner you and they would tell you God's will. Well, I'm going to make a dogmatic statement tonight about God's will for every Christian in this room. But don't throw anything at me until you hear me out. I'm not here to tell you who you're going to marry, what car you're going to buy. But I will tell you this. I believe it's God's will for the best days of your life spiritually to be right now. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, God brings an indictment against the nation of Israel. He says, Israel, I remember what you used to be like. But here's what you are now. And so listen with me for the next few minutes as God describes the nation of Israel and ask yourself the question, does this describe me? And I trust that you'll hear God's plea with Israel 
and you take it personally tonight. Now he begins in the first part of the chapter by talking about Israel's past condition. He says, Israel, this is what you used to be like. He's reminiscing as we would talk about the good old days in verse 2. He says, go and cry. God said, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus saith the Lord. Now understand the significance of that. God's giving his direction to the prophet. And he says, Jeremiah, when you go to those people, you go there and the first words out of your mouth is, God said this. It's interesting. I've got three kids. I was raised as an only child. And uh, after having three kids and, and, and watching them grow up, boy, it's been a real exciting thing. I see what all I missed out on in my childhood. But you know, here's the strangest phenomenon. My two boys can be out in the front yard playing, and I can send their kid baby daughter out there and say, Karis, you tell those boys to come in for supper. And she can open the door, step out on the porch, and say, hey, boys, it's time to come to supper, and they just keep on playing. She can come in, shut the door, and she says, Daddy, I told them to come inside, but they're not going to do it. And then I tell her, Honey, you go out there on the porch and you tell them that Dad said, Get in here now. <laughs> and so when she goes out there and says, Dad said, it stops right there. We're, why didn't you say that to start with? Well, God sends... Jeremiah to the nation of Israel. And he says, you make sure that they know, Jeremiah, this just aren't your words, these are mine. And he begins to describe how Israel used to be. He begins by saying, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth. He points out to Israel, he says, Israel, I remember when you were pleasant. I remember the kindness of your youth. Uh, for those of us that are a little older, you know, uh, we remember the kindness of youth. Do you remember the inexhaustible amount of energy that you had? I wish that I had the energy that I had as a 16-year-old who never used his head in playing basketball, and I had it now. Because I'd be one of the best basketball players in the world. I had learned through the years to use my brain. But by the time I learned to use my brain, I had no energy left. You remember the kindness of youth? There weren't aching joints, an endless supply of energy. God looks back, he says, Israel, I remember in your early days, I remember the kindness of thy youth. And he uses that as a picture to describe their vibrance and vitality. He continues on and he says, The love of thine espousals when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. He said, Israel, I remember not only when you were pleasant. He said, Israel, I remember when you were passionate, when you followed after me. For you married couples in the room tonight, do you remember when you first discovered her? Pursuing her today is a lot different than pursuing her yesterday and years ago. Nowadays, you do it via texting and email, but it used to be old handwritten notes. Days of waiting, wondering if the postal service had done its job. But now it's instantaneous communication, and if you don't text me back in five seconds, you're ignoring me. <clears throat> but you remember those early days and your pursuit of her, or if I dare even say it, your pursuit of him. <laughs> Some of you say, well, I was a little bold and I took the first step. Well, whatever the case, do you remember those early days? <coughs> we had a professor at the college several years ago. He told the story about how that when he discovered his uh, wife-to-be, she wanted nothing to do with him. As a matter of fact, when he would conveniently make himself available to her, she was like, get lost, leave me alone. She didn't want anything to do with him. And he made up his mind. He said, you know what? She can't leave what won't leave her. <laughs> he was relentless. And it worked. Eventually, he grew on her enough that eventually they'd get married and they're happily serving the Lord tonight. Now, I'm not saying for you fellas that uh, maybe that's the way you ought to do it because I don't want to be responsible for your early demise. Uh, it may be that her dad has a way of persuading you to leave her alone. And it's a pretty pointed one if you get what I'm saying. 
But even in that relationship, that human relationship that we forge with a future spouse or your spouse, you go back and you think about those days of passion. Remember the love of thine espousals. My wife and I, we wrote tons of notes back and forth in those days. God said, I remember those were great days. They sure were pleasant. There was no doubt you loved me. There's no doubt about it at all. God said, I remember, Israel, when you were pleasant. I remember when you were passionate. You followed after me in the wilderness. And also said, Israel, I remember when you were pure. Notice with me verse number four. In verse number four, it says, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. Don't let the word holiness scare you. Some people define holiness as today. We've, uh, I, as I was driving here, I saw a guy, it was an Amish fella, who's bought a house near us and, I mean, torn everything apart. And he's just about rebuilding it from scratch. And he was walking down the road, not driving a car. And his, uh, his uh, wardrobe was, or he was walking down the road and his wardrobe was very plain. He was wearing a bluish type shirt with black suspenders and black pants, big beard, and a big, big broad brim hat. And somebody would say, that's holiness. Well, uh, that's not quite the essence of the word. But I'm afraid that in Christianity today, that's, that holiness has such, a, uh, it has such a bad rap, if I could say it that way, that we don't take it seriously. You know, when God saved me, He didn't save me to do what I wanted to do. He saved me to set me apart and make me into the image of Jesus. And as a saint, which you are a sanctified one, God is setting you apart from the world. You see, the same grace of God that saved me is the same grace of God that teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present world. I want to ask you this question as we hurry on tonight. Are there things that you do in your life tonight that you never would have done 10 years ago? Because you've lost a sense of God's holiness. There may be some in this room, you say, years ago I would have never listened to that kind of entertainment because I'm going to tell you, it's filled with cursing and it's filled with innuendo and that stuff would have bothered me. But tonight you find your heart hollow. And your heart apathetic because you've tasted of the world? Are there things that you would do tonight that you wouldn't have done five years ago? But the problem is not that God has moved the goalpost. It's just you've become more distant from God and you've lost a sense of His holiness. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. My friend, if you're here tonight and you're living in the past, best days of your life and that we're, spiritually we're in the past. Listen, tonight God has a word for you. Listen and you'll hear it. So number one tonight, we see Israel's past condition. But number two, I want you to see their present coldness. God is now going to reveal to them where they're at at the time that this message is being delivered. <coughs> Gentlemen, you, you uh, on occasion will find yourself at a very dreaded place called the mall. I'm not very familiar with malls, and I try to be very unfamiliar with them if I can. And if you do see me in the mall with my wife, it's because I love her, not because I love shopping. <laughs> but for we men, when we go to the mall, we have to use survival tactics. We lose our sense of bearing, and we go to the kiosk, or we go to the display board and on the side, in big white letters, it has the word directory. And that's where I go. Because I'm not interested in going to Bed Bath & Beyond. If I can go to a sporting place, or better yet, the food court. That's where I need to go. And so whenever I look on that map, whenever I look on that directory and I see that great assortment of shops 
that really do not interest me. And I find the food court and my heart begins to beat with excitement. I have to look for that star that's on the directory. You know which one I'm talking about? It says, you are here. And once I figure out where I'm at, I can get to where I need to go. Let me tell you tonight, if your heart is not as close as it used to be years ago, you need to look at the directory tonight and you need to see where you're at. Not just to be discouraged or to be pushed down, but to understand once you figure out where you're at, then you can get to where you need to go. Amen. Israel, where are you tonight? Well, God begins in verse number five. He says, thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? Now, God asks Israel a question. You remember when you were a kid and your parents asked you questions? Questions like this, do you want a spanking? Do you want me to come up there? How about this one? Do you want me to give you something to really cry about? I've heard questions like that. And I'm going to tell you, whenever my parents asked questions like that, I didn't smart off and say, oh, yes, please give it to me. I want just come here right now. No, I'm telling you, when those questions were posed, there was a seriousness that came with it. And you didn't dare say anything. You just listened. It's one thing when your parents ask you a question and it holds a great amount of seriousness, but it's another thing when God asks you a question. Let me tell you something. When God asks you a question, that's not a time to be smart. It's not even a time just to have ill attention. Listen, you better give them your undivided attention. And he begins by indicating the distance that Israel has from God. He says, Wherefore, what iniquities have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? If I could just give you the Beal paraphrase, basically God's saying, What have I done to you to cause you to just push me aside? You know, in this world, sometimes our relationships get a little bit skewed and Somebody does something to us and as a result, we treat them coolly. Have you ever done that before? I have. You say you shouldn't have. You're right. I shouldn't have. And you should stop lying like you're perfect. <laughs> Sometimes in a marital relationship, a spouse says something. And when that's said, you don't want to hug them right now. But do you understand when God said, what iniquity have I done to you? We all know the answer. God's never done one thing wrong towards us. Well, there's been a lot of things I haven't understood. But I'm figuring out in this lifetime, the longer I live, the more he knows and the more I don't know. God's not done anything to drive us away. It's of our own volition, our own sinful nature. And God talks about the distance between Israel and in himself when he says that what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me. Uh, to me, that's a very powerful description. If I asked you tonight, where's, what's the most dangerous place in America? What would you say? I'm sure everybody would have an opinion. Listen, there's a bunch of Baptists in this room tonight. If you have 60 Baptists in this room, that means 85 opinions. But if I ask you tonight and I said, what's the most dangerous place? Somebody might say, I'll tell you, it's Chicago. You can't carry a gun in Chicago unless you're a police officer or a thief. <laughs> you say, well, thieves, they can't carry. Well, they're not supposed to, but they do. Why the law abiding citizens get shot. Somebody else says, well, New York City, I'm telling you, that's a dangerous place to be. Others say, I'll tell you, it's San Francisco. Some people, you, you could say, boy, this part, of the, this part of the city is bad. All of us tonight could give an opinion about the most dangerous place to be. But I want to remind you of something. 
I believe the most dangerous place for us to be tonight is to be in the auditorium of the Morganton Baptist Church and to be far from God. Sometimes you're a lot farther away than you think. Somebody sits in a pew, they're in the right place, but their hearts are disengaged. A time when you came to church and it was joyful and now you find your heart distant from God. I want to ask you, how far are you away from Him tonight? When I was a kid growing up, my dad, he taught me how to squirrel hunt. <coughs> and he'd take me squirrel hunting. You say it's hunting. No, I don't know what hunting is, but I do know what hunting is. <laughs> I found out in college it was hunting, but growing up it was hunting, and we'd go squirrel hunting. And when I was a kid, my dad would take me in the woods in the back, and the woods seemed like Yellowstone National Park. I mean, and when you're a kid, everything looks big and huge. And after walking what seemed like hours, when in actuality it was just a couple of minutes, we'd sit down at the base of a hickory tree. And we would sit there with our rifles or guns and we would just wait for the squirrels to come out. Well, one day we were out there and I sat down beside my dad. We probably weren't there 10 minutes. And I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I'm thirsty. And now I know that feeling as a parent. When you're out with your children and they're young and you're like, we just got here, uh, we just got on the road and you're telling me you've got to use the bathroom five minutes ago. I asked, does anybody need to go? You said, no. And now we've got to pull off the road. I understand that now as a parent. I understand a little bit about how my dad must have felt. <coughs> my dad probably took a deep breath, said, I can't believe this. And he said, all right. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to go that way. And he said, just walk straight that way. Just go, keep walking straight that way. You'll come out the house, go inside, get us something to drink and come back. And I said, yes, sir. And I did. I watched that direction and I just took and just locked my eyes on it. And I went that way. And sure enough, it brought me out at our place and hopped up and through the back door, went to the, ca the uh, kitchen. My mom's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting us something to drink. I had a drink in each hand, one for him, one for me. I came back in the woods, and at that point, now it looks like Yellowstone National Park. I don't know if I came from that way, that way, that way, that way. Dad's not there to point me and say, if you go that way, you'll wind up at that tree. And so I did what any boy would do. You refuse to admit you're lost, and you just try to find your way. And you usually end up in a worse predicament. And I finally came to the point where I realized I'm done for. I have no idea. I don't even know how to get back home. And I'll never forget, I dropped to my knees with those drinks in my hands, and I just boo-hooed. And when I say boo-hoo, I mean cry, just without shame, bald. Just, Wee! I mean like a siren. And finally, when my dad heard that, I'll never forget hearing his voice. He said, hey, over here. And man, I'm going to tell you, as soon as I heard that, the tears dried up. And I mean, I just made my way to the voice and there was a glad reunion. And you know, that was, that was a pretty memorable thing as a child. I still remember it to this day. I guess I'll be scarred the rest of my life because I didn't pay attention. But I'm going to tell you what I've learned as an adult. There's something worse than being a child and having lost your way. And that's being an adult and you're far from God and you're separated. I'm not one to preach on feelings all the time, but that's a bad feeling. God said, Israel, there's distance. You have gone far from me. And then at the end of verse 5, he says, you have walked after vanity and are become vain. He says, not only do I see your distance, but I see your direction. Walking after vanity. What is vanity? If you want to learn about vanity, just read the book of Ecclesiastes. And you don't have to be a dictionary, but just to read that and you see that vanity is emptiness. Chasing after something that's there for a moment and it's gone. No substance. 
I want to ask you, what's your direction? Are you aimless tonight? Do you find yourself just floating around? You're just walking after vanity. That's where Israel was at. He said, Israel, I see your distance. I see your direction. In verses 6 and 7, he says, I see your dissatisfaction with me. They didn't ask, where's the Lord? He got us out of this mess. He'll get us out of this one. And God had delivered them to a land that was full of blessing. But when they got to it, they defiled the land. They took everything that God had given them and they stomped on it. Why? Because they were dissatisfied, didn't have what they wanted. I've seen people raised in fine Christian homes with a mom and dad that loved them and taught them more about the Bible than I ever learned in the home that I was raised in, only to watch them stomp on it. Why? Because instead of saying, give me Jesus, they say, give me the world. That's what I want. That's exactly where Israel was at. It wasn't give me God who's done all of this for me. It was what I want. Give me the world. And I'll tell you what, you may think you want the world, but then when you get it, you'll find out soon it's not what you bargained for. It uses you. It leaves you to a point of desperation and you're hollow and empty. But that's exactly where Israel was at. God had given them so much. I'm going to tell you, God had parted the Red Sea. He had fed them even in the midst of complaining. You just look at the history of Israel. God did all of that and here they are. They're just stepping on it. They're stomping on it. My friend, if you're here tonight and you say, boy, I'm just so dissatisfied. I am so unsettled. It very well may be because you're thirsty for the wrong thing. That's quite a grocery list that God gives them, isn't it? There's nothing, by the way, there's nothing like unthankful people. You do something nice for somebody and they just sort of spit in your face. It doesn't make you want to give them anything else, does it? <coughs> I remember one time I was mad at my dad. My dad came up to me and he said, here's a dollar. I was just, a, I mean, a small kid. And I'll never forget, I took that dollar and I ripped it up. And I threw it in the trash can and just looked at him like, hmm. I'll guarantee you one thing. He didn't give me anything else after that except what I didn't want. But if we find, listen, you know, if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, listen to me, God saved you. All that sin that you couldn't do anything with, God washed it away. <laughs> It blows my mind. I hope for all eternity, I just marvel at the fact, here's a God who's omniscient and He's chosen to remember my sin no more. <laughs> that is such, that's, that's so, it's mind-blowing to me. That, just in that itself, God's done more for me than any of you could ever do for me. And yet I choose not to live for Him or I choose to live my own way. How unthankful I am. So first of all, we see their past. We see their present condition. But last of all, I want you to hear God's pleading cry. That's found in verse number 9. Notice verse 9 begins with the word wherefore. <coughs> Let me tell you what that word means. That word means take a good look at the first eight verses and understand everything that's just taken place. So I want to rehearse it for just a moment. Basically, God says, Israel, I remember when you were cute. Oh, I remember when you were something to be looked at. You had that energy and oh, you loved me. Your arms came out and you wanted me. And why Israel, I mean, everybody knew that you were mine. But then you started straying. Israel, I'd done so much for you, and instead of saying, where is the Lord, you just cast me to the curb. Israel, nobody's ever given you anything more than I have. And now even your leadership, the prophets are going out and they're, they're telling lies and nobody's doing right and all of you are ungrateful, you're unthankful, and you're unholy, wherefore? 
But God writes verse 9 a lot different than we would. When he says, wherefore, I will yet plead with you. When somebody hurts you, what do you want to do to them? Everybody straightens up, halo over their head, and they say, turn the other cheek. <laughs> I didn't ask you what you're supposed to do. I asked you, what do you want to do? There's something inside of every one of us that calls for vengeance, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I've heard people who didn't even think of any of the Bible. They could quote that. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'm so glad tonight that God's not like us. Had we written verse 9, we'd say, I'll tell you a bunch of ingrates what's going to happen. I'll destroy every last one of you. You say, I wouldn't have said that. Well, you'd at least thought it. And yet God says, wherefore, I will yet plead with you. Now, folks, that's God's mercy and His love and His grace tonight. You know what that means? That means this. If you're here in this church and you're not where you, where you need to be with God, you'd say, boy, years ago the fire was really burning or months ago the fire was really burning and tonight... I am a shameful mess. Listen, there's a God in heaven that says, Hey, come back. Come here right now. Please, I want you. That word plead is a very strong word. You ever pled with anybody before? <clears throat> when I was a kid, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My dad drank heavily and there were several occasions... In which my dad threatened to leave my mom. I remember one in particular. It was in the living room and my dad said he'd had enough. He said, that's it. He said, I'm going to leave. He said, I'm leaving. He was probably in a drunken stupor. And I remember he was laying down on the couch or a bed that we had in the living room. And I remember jumping on top of his chest and just as a little boy, just crying. And I said, Daddy, please don't. Let. And I just wept for 30 minutes until probably he fell asleep out of his drunkenness and woke up and then everything was okay. But I still remember as a young boy that pleading in my heart. And I'm going to tell you that in great earnestness tonight, God's pleading with you. Pleading with you to swallow your pride. Pleading with you to stop listening to all the devil's excuses. And to return to him. And how serious is God about this? Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord. And then he said, and with your children's children will I plead. That's pretty serious business. God said, my pleading is going to be long and hard. I'm going to plead with you and I'm going to plead with your children's children. In public school, I rode the school bus all the way up until I got my license. I remember <coughs> sitting towards the back of the school bus, and that's usually where all the trouble took place. The farther you are from the, the bus driver, the less likely you are to get caught. And uh, there was a fellow in our neighborhood. His name was Thomas. And Thomas was a fellow, he and his family moved down from New Jersey. I'll never forget that because here this family from New Jersey is planted in a small community near Yadkinville, North Carolina. Do you understand the culture shock there? I mean, somebody can move from Charlotte to Yadkinville and that's culture shock, but New, New Jersey... And uh, one thing I remember about Thomas, he was very quick. He had comebacks for everything. I mean, you could throw something at him and he would throw it right back at you. And you didn't want to get into a, word of, uh, a war of words with Thomas because he was very quick on his feet. I remember sitting towards the back of the school bus. First time I ever heard this phrase in my life. I've heard it since then, but he's the one that introduced me to it. And I'm sure it wasn't original with him. But there was a boy that was aggravating Thomas and Thomas had had enough. 
And Thomas stood up with that huge fist of his raised up and he looked at this kid and he said, listen, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to hit you so hard that your grandchildren are going to have black eyes. <laughs> and never in my life have I ever felt the tension of a moment like that with the hilarious nature of what he said. I remember ducking down in the seat laughing hysterically. It just caught me off guard. Now, some of you literalists here tonight, you're like, would he really hit a fellow that hard? No, no, it wouldn't literally hit him that hard that his grandchildren would have black eyes, but he was trying to emphasize a point. But here, God is saying the depths of his plea, listen, it'll go to you and it'll go to your children's children. This is what I'm going to tell you tonight. God's serious about you getting back to where you need to be. And as hard as it is to fathom, he wants it to happen even more than you. And tonight, instead of listening to the world, you need to listen to his plea. One of the saddest points you'll ever reach in your life is when your spiritual best days are in your past. Growing up, I remember I was knocking on a door in our area neighborhood. I was a senior in high school. God had just called me to the ministry. And we came to a particular door. A man with a new move in came to the door. I said, hey, my name is Alton. This is Michael. We're from such and such Baptist church. And <coughs> we're out knocking on doors today, inviting people to come and join us for church on Sunday. And uh, I said, do you, you know, do you go to church anywhere? And he looked at me and he said, well, he said, boys, have you guys ever heard of Lester Roloff? Well, when he said that, I was a country fellow. I'd been exposed to some of the preaching of Lester Roloff. He was a very unique person. Uh, but one thing was for sure, he was so, uh, so passionate and so uh, firm in his belief about having orphanages to give people the gospel that uh, he went against terrible odds against the state of Texas and fought tooth and nail to give those orphans and give people that were from troubled backgrounds uh, the gospel in a school setting and, and just fought and paid the price. And so man was certainly imperfect, but uh, was a great, uh, just uh, he really stood for what he believed in. And he was a preacher of the gospel. And this man for 30 minutes, he's telling us stories. He said, I used to work with Lester Roloff and he was telling us all kinds of stories about him. Lester Roloff was a kind of preacher. A woman came up to him after service one time and said, Brother Roloff, you're so narrow-minded. And he said, well, ma'am, I'm on a narrow way. And he turned around and walked off. That's the kind of candor that he had in country sense. Well, I mean, for 30 minutes, I just listened to this man. He's telling us about serving in the Roloff homes. And I was spellbound. And finally, when he let me get a word in edgewise, I said, man, that's awesome. I said, now, where do you go to church? And he looked down. He said, I don't go anymore. I listened to that man tell me for 30 minutes about a time in his life where things were thriving and God was real. And by his own admission on his doorstep, he was far from God. I don't care your background tonight. That can happen to you if you let that coldness continue in your heart. And my prayer is what Fanny Crosby wrote many years ago. Draw me nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Will you hear God's plea tonight? I hope you will.